uh, this morning, this morning we come together and we celebrate Jesus' resurrection um, because 2,000 years ago we believed um, that on a Friday evening they nailed Jesus to a cross and he took his last breath. He said it is finished. They put him in a tomb. They sealed it. They put guards on watch. Um, but they just couldn't keep him in there. They just couldn't keep him in there. On, on the third day, on Sunday morning when uh, it was still early in the morning, the women were going to take care of Jesus' body and they found an empty tomb. And so we're here today to celebrate that. And uh, every year as a preacher, you get a little bit nervous to preach the big one. And it's like, why would you get nervous about preaching about Jesus' resurrection? It's one sermon. Like you only have to do one job today. Talk about Jesus getting out of the grave. You do that and it's a win. And guess what? We've already done it once and we're going to do it again. It's going to be a win. Come on. Come on. And so today we're actually going to, we're going to start a, a series of messages going through uh, the Gospel of John where we look at the I am statements of Jesus. And we're going to start with the most bold, audacious statement that Jesus made. And that is, I am the resurrection and the life. That's going to be our key verse today in uh, John chapter 11. If you want to go ahead and turn there, we're going to get there in a second and read a big old portion of scripture. But in John chapter 11, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Come on, who says stuff like that? First of all, if you make a statement like that, you'd better be able to back it up. And the story we're going to read this morning is Jesus backing up this statement, I am the resurrection and the life. And then this is a few weeks before, or a few days before Jesus actually rose. Not only is he going to bring Lazarus back from the grave, spoiler alert, that's where we're going, but Jesus is going to overcome the grave. Yes, yeah. Okay, so when he says, I am the resurrection and the life, he backs it up. That's right. He doesn't just say it and not, you know, some people, some people just like to talk a bit game and then they don't back it up. You ever been around people like that? I don't like people like that. I know I'm a preacher, I'm supposed to like everybody. I don't like people like that. If you talk a big game and you can't back it up, that me and you probably aren't going to be friends. I just won't like you. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm asking Jesus to help me work through that. But when Jesus says, when Jesus says that he's the resurrection and the life, he backs it up. He does it. All right? And so when we talk about Jesus being the resurrection and the life, it's more than, it's more than just something he did. This is important for us to understand. Resurrection isn't just something that Jesus did. Jesus is saying, this is who I am. I am resurrection. And when we come into a relationship with Jesus, we actually get to partake in that resurrection. Romans chapter 8 uh, has one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture where it says, don't you know that the same Spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead now lives inside of you? So not only is Jesus rose from the dead, He is resurrection, and now we're walking in resurrection because He's risen from the grave. And we all get to taste and see and walk in that. And I think every human heart has a longing for resurrection because who hasn't sinned? Yeah. Yeah. Who hasn't messed up? Who hasn't been far from God at some point or another? Every person in this room, I don't care how long you've been following Jesus, um, you may be at a good place right now, but you haven't always been there, have you? That's, right. That's nobody's story. Nobody's story is that I've always had it together. At some point, at some point there was some junk. There was a tomb you had to leave yeah. to follow Jesus. Right. That's what we celebrate today. And in every heart, we long for this resurrection. And there's, there's some of us in this room today, I feel like Jesus is going to say, hey, it's time for you to get up and get out and leave this tomb behind. You don't have to live here anymore. I've got better things for you. Praise God for that. Amen? And so I believe resurrection is written on every person's heart. And... I remember uh, it was a couple years ago now, uh, my youngest Sammy, she got stuck on Homeward Bound. You guys remember that movie? I'm a 90s kid, so Homeward Bound was a great 90s movie, yeah. and it's great. You remember the story of Homeward Bound, where you've got the animals that got separated from their owners. You got Shadow and Sassy and Chance. You remember them? <laughs> you me remember? Like, I know who they are because it got stuck on loop in my house for a while. Because when a three-year-old likes a movie, they can watch it. Let's start it again, Dad. Well, okay. I mean, this isn't the worst thing to have to watch over again. So we got stuck on Homeward Bound, but the first 
first time um, that Sammy ever watched this movie uh, was with my sister, and then I, I watched it with her again, like, within two days. And she was about three and a half uh, years old, three or three and a half, and she's watching this movie, and the animals get separated from their, their owners, the kids, and it's just this whole story of getting them back together. And at the end, it's the, the climactic moment where you have, uh, you have Sassy and Chance, they finally made it home. But the kind of plot twist is Shadow, the old golden retriever that's been leading everybody along, has fallen into a pit. And he can't get out of this pit. Do you remember the movie? If you haven't seen it, you got to watch this movie. It is, it is solid stuff, all right? But Shadow is stuck in the pit, and he can't get out. And he finally says, uh, guys, you, you, you got to go on. He tells the other two animals, go on. The cat and the, the bulldog, you guys go on without me. And so you have this moment that the kids have made it back home, and they're calling for the pets, and here they come running, you know. Uh, Sassy comes over the hill and she gets the little girl and they're hugging and it's a reunion and then the little boy has chance and they're united and then Peter who owns Shadow he's standing there, he's calling and it's the, you know, the cliffhanger moment where you're like this is a kids movie, I know that dog's coming over that hill but you're still feeling it, you know like you're still feeling it, you're feeling the pain of man, Peter really wants Shadow to come over that hill and finally, it's like he's given up and he's turning. And Sammy, as she's watching this movie, she's broken up, all right? Yeah. Like the first time, she's got tears rolling down her face as, as Shadow's not coming over the hill. And then, as just as Peter turns, you know, you hear Shadow bark. And here he comes running over the hill. And Sammy begins to weep and sob tears of joy that here comes Shadow. He's made it. And I'm telling you this story because at three years old, resurrection resonates in my daughter because I see that as a, a picture of resurrection. I'm not saying that she understood that Jesus died and rose again from that movie, but that's a story that points to resurrection. Somebody in a pit came out of the pit. And what got, what got Shadow out of that hole? That's kind of a plot hole there by the way. Like, you really don't know. There's, there's nothing that, that shows you how he got... Well, I'll tell you how he got out of there. Love. Shadow loved Peter. And Peter loved Shadow. And he wasn't going to stay in that ground. He was coming to get his owner. He was coming to get his boy. And I would say that's a great picture of resurrection. What brought Jesus out of that tomb? Why did he defeat death, hell, and the grave? What, what motivated him to do that? His love for us. Amen. His love for us and all of us deep within us. We know, we know we need that resurrection love in our life. And so this morning, that's what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about the resurrection love of Jesus Christ that brought him out of the grave and has invited us to experience that new life today. And I think every one of us, we're, we're on some journey. We're, we're somewhere along the spectrum. There's some of us, we've believed in it. We're living in it. There's some of us, maybe we know about it, but we've wandered away from it. You know, it's, it's one thing to know about Jesus. It's another thing to really know him and to have encountered his love and to be in his love. And so for some of you, you need to make that 18-inch journey from your head to your heart because he wants to give us a new heart. That's, that's what he wants for us. And for some of us, maybe for the first time, you're going to hear Jesus saying, come out of that tomb. You don't have to live here anymore. I've got greater things for you. That's, that's what we've been praying for. We've been praying for people, just like Lazarus, as we're going to read in this story, as he left his tomb behind because of Jesus' resurrection love. I believe there's people in this room this morning. You're going to walk out of your tomb today. You're going to leave it behind. And you're going to step into the new life that Jesus has for you. Amen? Amen. Let's read a big passage of Scripture this morning in John chapter 11. I've given you plenty of time to get to John chapter 11. So I want us to look at John chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. If you don't have a Bible, there may be a Bible in one of the chairs in front of you, or you can follow along on the screen with us. We're going to read these verses today of a man named Lazarus that Jesus brings back from the grave. Now, verse 1. A certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, and Bethany was the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. 
So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death, for it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved, loved Martha and her sister Mary and Lazarus. Pause here, because everything we need to understand about this story, we need to understand it through verse 5. Everything that's about to take place is taking place because Jesus loves Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And the way Jesus works isn't for our comfort and isn't for the easiest outcome. Sometimes you've got to go through hard stuff so that Jesus can prove his love for you and so that you can encounter the glory of God. Because yeah. when Jesus loves you, what he wants most for you is for you to know the glory of God. He's not always about easy. Uh-oh. <laughs> Who doesn't like easy? I love easy, all right? Don't, don't get me wrong. I love comfort. But that's not always what God's about in our lives. That's not always the route Jesus takes us on to get us to where he's going for us to encounter God's glory. And so we need to see what we're about to read through this, this lens of he loves us and because he loves us, he wants to experience God's glory. All right? Now, verse number six. So they heard that Lazarus was ill and he stayed two days longer. It's a lot, Jesus. Some friend you are. Right? He stays two days longer in the place where he was. And then after this, he says to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just seeking to stone you. They want to kill Jesus. Are you going there again? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. And the disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he's going to recover. This is no big deal. Uh, the disciples are always slow to catch on, aren't they? So many times Jesus is saying stuff, and they're not picking up what he's putting down. <laughs> no dummies. No dummies. Verse 13. Um, the disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he's going to recover. And Jesus, spoke and Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. And then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake... I'm glad I wasn't there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go, that we may die with him. Now, Thomas, he gets a bad rap, doesn't he? What do we usually call Thomas? Yeah. Doubting, doubting Thomas. But here's Thomas. Jesus says, let's go. And he's like, well, we're probably going to die if we go with him. Let's go die. I say Thomas is pretty legit. <laughs> He's ready to go die with Jesus. So maybe like cut Thomas a little bit of slack. Eleven of his friends or ten of his friends tell him that Jesus walked through a wall and appeared to them. And he goes, I don't believe you guys. Really? Like you're going you're gonna, to like hold that against him and call him doubting Thomas for all of eternity? Give me a break. Like you probably wouldn't have believed him either. You'd ask him what kind of fish they'd been eating or something. <laughs> So Thomas says, let's go. We may die with him. Verse 17, now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. And Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, who's coming into the world. And when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35. We're going to talk about this verse a little bit today. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. 
So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, some of them said, could he who opened the eyes of the blind man also not have kept this man from dying? And then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. And it was a cave and a stone lay against it. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? What kind of tomb is Jesus laid in? Well, it's a cave with a stone in front of it. And I just want to point out here that this, this is, at least in the Gospels that we read, this is the third time Jesus brings somebody back from the dead. Um, on one occasion, there's a funeral passing by and a widow has lost her son. And Jesus is moved with compassion and raises that boy up. On another occasion, Jairus, who is a leader in the synagogue, lost his daughter. And Jesus came and raised Jairus' daughter up. Now, on those occasions, it's, it's likely Jairus' daughter had just died and the widow's son had probably just died. So on those occasions, it was really easy to refute, refute. well, did Jesus really bring him from the dead? You know, maybe they, you know, they were just kind of had a little stroke and he just happened to say a nice prayer and they, they came back. But with Lazarus, yeah. he's been in the ground four days. And when Jesus says, roll the stone away, uh, one of the sisters is going to say, oh, Lord, he's going to smell. There's going to be an odor, like death and decay have set in. There's no doubt Lazarus was dead. So of the resurrection miracles, this is by far the most profound that Jesus performs because there's no questioning that Lazarus was dead. In fact, uh, this miracle was so powerful that the Jewish leaders want to kill Lazarus because so many Jewish people are putting their faith in Jesus because of what happened to Lazarus. So, just to put that into a little bit of context for you, Jesus said, take... Okay, so, Jesus deeply moved again, verse 38. They came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there's going to be an odor, for he's been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So when Jesus loves us, what does he want us to experience? The glory of God. So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes, and he said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me, and I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you have sent me. And when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth, and Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. The big idea of my message this morning is this. Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life, His love is now calling all of us out of our graves. Just like Jesus called Lazarus out of his grave, we're getting called out of our graves too. Man, that's good. And I want to talk to you about the resurrection love that brings us out of our grave today. Would you pray with me real quick? And then I want to share with you about resurrection love. Lord, I thank you for each person in this room. I thank you for what you want to speak into us. I thank you for your word today. And I thank you, God, that when your word goes forth, it accomplishes what you set it forth to do. So God, I believe as we've heard your word and we've heard your words that you said, I am the resurrection and the life and those who believe in me will never die. We believe that today, Lord. We, we, by faith, receive your word today. And we thank you, Lord, that you've called all of us out of our graves, out of darkness, into your light, into your life. Lord, thank you for what you're going to do in this place today. Have your way, Lord Jesus. Be glorified. Be glorified in us. Let's get in your name. Amen. Amen. So five things, really quickly. Do you believe me? Quickly. I don't, at the last service, see, if you had come to the early service, I, I was working against the clock, so I had to cut it off. I don't have to cut it off in this service. So you got to sleep late, but you've got to listen to me preach longer. Sorry. <laughs> I, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Everybody wants to get to lunch. No. <clears throat> but five truths that I want to talk to you about Jesus' love. Five things that we see about Jesus' love in this story. The first thing that I want you to see is that Jesus' love is timeless. Jesus' love is timeless. And here's, here's what I mean by this. Jesus' love doesn't work according to our calendars or our timelines or our schedules. His love operates outside of it. A lot of times we think Jesus should move a certain way in a certain time frame, don't we? We think God should line certain things up in our life exactly how we want to tell Him to do it. 
Right? Why did Mary and Martha send word to Jesus that their brother was ill? Because they wanted Jesus to come heal him. When did they want Jesus to come heal him? Right then. When you pray, when do you want the answer to your prayer? I'll tell you when I want my answers right now. I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait on God's timeline. I want to tell him how I think it should be, and I want him to comply. Which is out of whack, I understand. Some of you are like, hey, he's God and you're human. I know, right? That's stupid. Like, I need to say my prayer and go, okay, Lord, I trust you. you you're going to do what you need to do. But if we're honest, if we're honest, right, we want the Lord working on our time schedule. And here's Lazarus. He's on his deathbed. And Mary and Martha don't know what else to do. So they say, hey, uh, Jesus is our friend. He drops in and we feed him. So maybe we can call in a favor here. <laughs> you know, like we've taken care of him on multiple occasions. So let's call in a favor to this man that's uh, raised up other people from the dead. This man that's opened blind eyes and opened deaf ears and cast demons out of people. Like, let's get a hold of Jesus and get him here before Lazarus dies. And what does Jesus do? waits two days. Jesus doesn't work according to your schedule. Just want to let you know that, that his love doesn't work according to your schedule because he wants you to experience God's glory. And so sometimes if he answered your prayer exactly how you want it right here, right now, it wouldn't lead you to encounter the glory of God. Yes. <laughs> but he'll let you sweat it out sometimes. He'll let you go through some stuff sometimes. He'll let you experience some pain sometimes so that you can experience his glory as well. Yes, that's right. Paul said the present sufferings of this moment are worth comparing to the eternal glory that we'll experience. Yes. Amen. Listen, there are temporary things that we go through, no doubt. But we're, when we're in resurrection love, Jesus is always at work doing something. And his timeline may not line up to how we want things to work out, but... He will, he will bring God's glory yeah. if we'll keep trusting him. Amen. So, so here, here they are, here they are. Jesus, why haven't you showed up yet? Why aren't you here yet? Why aren't you on time like I think you should be? I can promise that every person in this room has probably asked that same question. Why aren't you showing up right now, Jesus? This is when I need you, now person I love is dying. My marriage is tearing apart. My kids are losing their mind. My friend is sick. Why aren't you showing up now? I want them to work on our time schedule. I don't think why is a bad question. I think it's the wrong question. I think the question we should ask in the waiting is how. How are you going to reveal your glory in this? Because when we're asking why, I think there's a little doubt attached to that. Like, why are you allowing this to happen, Lord? And instead of asking from a place of why, let's ask from, uh, asking from the place of doubt and why, why don't we ask from the place of faith? Yes. Saying, Lord, how? I, I, don't, I don't know why it's happening, but I believe somehow you can turn this around for glory. Amen. Amen. The, the old timers in church used to say, uh, he's never early. He's never late, but he's always right on time. I believe that's true. Lazarus was dead four days. He was dead four days. Everybody thought Jesus was late. They thought he had missed it. But when he said, Lazarus, come out, guess what? He was right on time, wasn't he? <laughs> and what you're going through, you may think Jesus is late. He's not showing up. Just wait a minute. His love is timeless. He always shows up. He always works for the good of those that love him. So his love is timeless. Number two, Jesus' love is fearless. And so what we see is that uh, the religious leaders of the day have had enough of Jesus. He's gaining influence. He's gaining authority. And the Jewish leaders want Jesus dead. And it's not a secret. Like, it's public knowledge. Jesus' disciples know it. The public know it. And so everybody's expecting that Jesus is going to go into hiding. That, that he'll, he'll kind of keep himself in the shadows so that he doesn't get killed by these religious leaders. They have that authority. They could literally take Jesus outside of a town, grab rocks, and throw rocks at him until he's dead. Talk about a, a bad way to go. Not worse than the cross, though. 
So they're, they're looking for a way to stone Jesus, to kill Jesus, and what we see is Jesus' love is fearless. He doesn't let the threats of the religious people keep him from getting to Lazarus. I think a lot of us, we think that somewhere, somehow in our lives, there's something that's happened that's going to keep Jesus' love away from us. I don't know how many people I've talked to that they think there's something in their past that, that's going to scare Jesus away. No, there's not. His love is fearless. And he, he proved that. When we celebrated Good Friday, when we remembered the cross of Jesus, we, we see in that that his love is fearless, that there's not any length he won't go to to show us his love. Right. When he died on that cross, do you realize the type of death that was? I mean, literally, he was so uh, stretched out on that cross, could not get any breath, that his lungs would have co collapsed and he drowned in his own blood. Death by asphyxiation. I, I can't think of a much worse way to die. And Jesus experienced that willingly. Right. He went to the cross knowing that that's how he had to die to pay for our penalty, to pay for our sin, so that he could redeem us and give us the life that he has for us. So let me tell you something. There's nothing in your past that's causing Jesus to go, you know what, I don't think I, don't think I can overcome that. There's nothing you've done that his blood and his resurrection can't overcome. Because right. his love is fearless. Number three, Jesus' love is vulnerable. I love this about Jesus. I love that his love is vulnerable. Because when I read this story, I, I'm always like, what, Jesus? Like, really? Because he shows up to Lazarus' tomb knowing good and well what he's about to do. He's already told his disciples like two days earlier, he says, I'm going to show you guys God's glory. We've got to let Lazarus die so that I can go bring him back from the dead. Like he already knows what he's going to do. But when he enters into the pain of the moment, when he gets with those people that he loves, he loves Mary. He loves Martha. He sees their pain. And he doesn't just watch their pain from a distance. He doesn't just uh, show up and go, hey, I'm here. And I'm about to bring your brother out of the tomb. So stop this crying nonsense. You know, you, you don't need to be crying anymore. I've arrived. I'm going to bring him back from the dead. No, he doesn't do that. What Jesus does, his love enters into our pain with us. When he sees us broken, it breaks him. In John eleven thirty five, 35, it may be the shortest verse in the Bible, but it is a profound verse in Scripture. Jesus wept. He knows he's going to raise Lazarus out of the tomb, but he still enters into the pain. And there's so many people, when you're in the midst of your pain and your brokenness, what do you feel? You feel alone. You feel like everybody's forgotten. You feel like God's turned his back on you. Don't you think that's exactly how Mary and Martha feel? They love their brother. They need their brother. They're probably relying on him to make it through in this time period. They feel alone and Jesus shows up and he enters right into the middle of that pain and he weeps with them. And so for some of you, you may feel alone. But let me tell you something you're not. I don't think anybody's ever wept alone. You've never wept alone. Jesus' love is vulnerable. It enters into our pain. It feels our pain. You've never been alone. You've never wept alone. The fourth thing I want you to see today is that Jesus' is love. Jesus' is love is life. Man, somebody should, said, should have said amen right there. Jesus' is love is life. Jesus' is love is life. Jesus calls forth Lazarus' dead body and life returns to him and he comes out of the grave. Let's just pack it up and go home right there because that's just so good. And what Jesus has done for Lazarus He's done over and over again for a couple thousand years. Lazarus isn't the only person Jesus has called out of a tomb, out of darkness, out of brokenness, out of pain. He's not the only one. Thousands and thousands, millions upon millions of times, Jesus has called people out of their grave. See, if you're a follower of Jesus, Lazarus' experience is your experience. Maybe not in the literal sense, but in the spiritual sense, no doubt, you have heard Jesus call you by name, saying, come up and come 
come out of your past, out of your shame, out of your brokenness. I've got a new life for you. That's an experience for every person. That's what we, uh, that's what we celebrate at Easter. So we, because Jesus left his grave behind, we leave our graves behind. Because Jesus called our name, we have new life. I mean, I can only conjecture here. I don't even know what to think about this, what to say about this. But wouldn't you love to have that interview with Lazarus? Like, just sit him down. Like, what was going on? What do you remember? <laughs> and then what was it like taking your first, first breath the second time? <laughs> like, what was that all about? Like, how crazy is that? I'm telling you, spiritually, in this room, I believe there's people, you're going to take your first breath spiritually today. Jesus is going to call you out of your tomb, and you're never going to look back. Never going to look back. That's, that's what I love about Jesus. He, he says, there's no condemnation for those who are in me. So many of us, we spend so much time, after we know Jesus loves us and has forgiven us and has cleansed us, we spend so much time dealing with guilt and shame. And Jesus has said, no, don't look back at that tomb anymore. I've called you out of that. There's no guilt. There's no shame. There's no condemnation. Quit looking back. I've called you out of that. The only reason to look back is to tell other people that you don't live there anymore. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Come on. His love is life and last, his love is is freedom. Jesus' love is freedom. Lazarus comes out of that tomb, but he's still wrapped up in these linen strips of cloth and the, the, the thing they put over his face, the cloth they put over his face. See, they would have done this because Jewish people didn't embalm bodies. They wanted to come and mourn and they wanted to have time with the body, just, just like we do, like going to a funeral and viewing a body. And so in, in order to kind of push back the stench of death. They would uh, take different spices and ointments and anoint the body after, it had, after the person had deceased and uh, then they would wrap them up. Okay? To try to keep the stench down a little bit. And Lazarus comes out of the tomb. He's alive, but he's still got these remnants of death hanging off of him. I think this is a great picture of after Jesus calls us into new life. Yeah, there's old bits and pieces of our old life that tries to hang on, but what does Jesus say? Unbind, Lazarus. Start taking that stuff off. Listen, when Jesus calls you out of your tomb, there might be some stuff still attached from your past trying to hold on to you, but here's what Jesus says. I, I am giving you resurrection life, and that means you're going to be free, so start taking that stuff off. And I believe that there's a process by which Jesus begins... Day by day, as we trust him and follow him and leave that tomb behind, day by day, we start taking the old stuff off. Because if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. So, if you're in this place and you're still struggling a little bit, welcome to the club. But Jesus has said, unbind him. Yeah. We're all in this process together where he's unbinding us. He's taken that old off and we're not going to stay. We're not going to stay in the old. We're not going to stay in the old habits and hang-ups and addictions and, and junk. But day by day, Jesus is taking them off of us so that we can walk in the new life that he's given us because he is the resurrection and the life. Luke chapter 24 says this. I, I just want us to read this account. Because we started by saying, okay, who, who makes a statement? I am the resurrection and life. Who, who can talk that talk? Well, somebody who overcomes death can say they are the resurrection and the life. See, Jesus didn't have somebody call his name. Jesus, I guess, called his own number and brought himself out. <laughs> Come on. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 6 says this, but on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men, these are angels, standing by them and dazzling a parable. They said, uh, as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. 
He is risen. Amen, somebody. He's not here. He's risen. So what I want to tell you is that when Jesus came out of that tomb, when Jesus came out of that tomb, it wasn't something he did, okay? It wasn't some miraculous thing that, that he just kind of said, okay, here's the cherry on top of my perfect life and my death. You know, here's this last bit of evidence. No, he didn't come out of that because it was something he did. He came out of the tomb because he is resurrection. Resurrection isn't something Jesus does. Resurrection is who he is. And now because Jesus is the resurrection and the life, he's calling all of us. I'm the resurrection and the life. I want you to be in my life and now you're going to experience resurrection and life because Jesus came out of his tomb we all get to walk out of ours too yes. amen. 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 amen Jesus is the resurrection he is the life and I believe I believe that Jesus is calling calling people out of their graves today because that's what he does I believe if you would hear his voice spiritually right now He's saying to you, come on, you've been where you're at long enough. Let's leave this tomb behind. Maybe you've known about Jesus for a long time, but you've never really made that step to say, you know what? I'm his. I'm done with my grave. I'm coming out. I'm telling you, he's calling. He's calling. Would you stand with me this morning?